Welcome everybody. And I am so excited to introduce you to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today. And today we are in the ladies room. And we like to say that the ladies room is that place where women talk about things we might not say just anywhere. You know, things that we can only say to one another because, well, face it, we've had some shared experiences. And here in the ladies room, we can be bold, we can be authentic, we can be transparent with one another, regardless the topic. So in the ladies room, we're not afraid to go there. Now, our session today lasts for about an hour. And if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and the attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. This is a conversation. It's not an interview. And if there is something though that you'd like to contribute anonymously, you can put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to share it for you. So our topic today in the ladies room is post-election, what's next? And I'm really excited to introduce our special guests today. And let me tell you just a little bit about each of them. First, we have Jen Shen. Jen is the crime lab manager with the Chula Vista Police Department. She's an adjunct professor and the owner of Jennifer Shen Forensics, where she provides consulting services, serves as an expert witness, and has assisted in guiding legislation where she co-authored Title 17, the California state law that governs forensic alcohol testing. Next, we have Gina Ray. Gina is known as an advocate for emerging, disruptive, and innovative technology and ideas. So in other words, she is a badass in the world of disruptive technology. She's the head of global public relations for Abby, which is a digital intelligence company. Abby technologies are used by more than 5,000 companies and government agencies to help them make intelligent business decisions and drive significant impact where it matters most. Carolyn Baker is the award-winning author of An Unintentional Accomplice, A Personal Perspective on White Responsibility. Carolyn spent decades in the nonprofit sector contributing to community-based efforts, addressing poverty and long-term homelessness. Today, she continues her work building communities that value all people as a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. And Marcy Bro is an acclaimed photographer who had a successful career with companies such as Giant Loop, TV Guide, and TiVo before deciding to combine her love of advertising and branding with her portrait photography passion, thus launching Marcy Bro Photography. She's also on the board of directors for Milestone House, a home for foster teen girls who are survivors of child abuse trauma, providing care and treatment in a caring, compassionate environment. So to say that we've got quite a team of, of what, I mean, just badass women here, you know, to have a conversation is an understatement. So, you know, this topic is um, post-election, what's next? And I don't know about you guys. I, I would imagine that, that we're all sort of in the same boat. Maybe not, you know, there, there's always some people that just really, really love uh, chaos. Um, but I think we have entered into such a this side or that side kind of world that it it leads me to wondering how, how do we move forward from this? You know, when when the divisiveness has become so visible and so hateful sometimes, like how do you move forward? From that. And I, I personally believe that as a country, as, um, as an organization, as friends, as a community, whatever, when there's been that level of them versus us, me versus you, black versus white, red versus blue, there's got to be some way that we're able to find a place to move forward with that. So I'm throwing that out there. It's not an intent to bash one side or the other to make a stand for one side or the other it's more like what what do we do now you know what do we do now seriously so i'm throwing that out to all of you um who wants to take off who wants to share their heart where they're 
where they're at right now, what their head is thinking. You know, I think what it comes down to is that we have a lot of fatigue, Patty. I think with just this entire year, um, everyone always jokes about like nothing else bad can happen and then something else happens like from fires to what, you know, whatever. But so we have fatigue with just not only with the election, but before the election, you know, there was about COVID and just the shutdowns. And, and I think that emotional, uh, that made an emotional toll. And then coupled with the election, I think that if we all just understand that we are all coming from a point of fatigue, then we can have more empathy for each other and understand that maybe it's not just that you have a different opinion, but on top of everything else, that is just making us more irritable and more sensitive and um, you know, more angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, I have a pretty interesting perspective, I think, because I'm in law enforcement, which has certainly taken a, a, a beating this last year, and I have four college-age students uh, in my home, um, and I'm married to uh, a pretty uh, liberal uh, man from a, a Jewish community in Minnesota, and I was raised as a pretty conservative Republican, so my world is very interesting and i will tell you i've always felt i've had a couple experiences that have been really important to me and um they really all come down to communication and i think a lot of what we're seeing is that people aren't communicating and i have two very liberal friends that i have had experiences with in the last three to four years one of which and when trying to have a conversation with her, just shut me down. Like, it was like, anyone that does X, Y, Z is completely, I mean, they are such a terrible person. I don't want to know anyone like that. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell you what I think. Then. And then I have another one who sat down on the beach with me and we spent like an hour just talking through all of our thoughts about everything. And at the end of that, we just understood each other so much better. We understood that part. I mean, I, I love her and I've known her forever, but we understood that part of each other so much better. And I've, I remembered that when I had to go home to four children who asked me how it was that I could possibly work in law enforcement. How could I even do that? And you know, that for me was so hard to look at my children and have them tell me that I must be a terrible person in order to work in law enforcement. So I just hung in on those conversations with them for hours and hours and hours and just talked and talked and talked until we really gained an understanding of what the world is like in my opinion and in their opinion and how, you know, how we can make it better and how, what we can do. And so to me, it comes down to communication. If you cut off the, the communication, then all that will do is divide you. And I think social media does that. You can be behind the keyboard and say whatever you want. It's really hard to sit in front of someone and tell them how you feel and open yourself up and be real and honest about them. So I think that's our problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah, really it. I think that's really it. Um, um, an important point that um, if, if people want to talk, you know, there's a, there's a lab at the University of Columbia that's called the Difficult Conversations Lab. And in order to participate, two opposing viewpoints have to want to try and understand each other, as opposed to wanting to be right. And I think if we look at, uh, I think your, your point also, Gina, was important that, you know, we're, we're tired. <laughs> but at the same time, we're called to be leaders in our own life. And I think the idea is at this election, half the country is disappointed. Just like in the 2016 election, half the country was disappointed. So the idea of empathy, I think, and desire to connect or to find unity is really key. And to stop the narrative of division because I think it has to do with what you're consuming also. If you're consuming a lot of narrative about division, we can be the voices for countering that, for stepping up against that narrative and to say, no, people can talk and people can come to understand and to find some, like if you're a police officer and you feel like no one understands what you experience, that's a terrible feeling. 
or just like to in this election, if I feel like people don't understand how I'm feeling, that's a feeling of being mad and sad. And, you know, we all can relate to what it feels like to not be, to, for no one to care what I think or feel. Mm -hmm. And so to just kind of have some empathy and some humility, you know, to be a humble winner in the 2016 or the 2020 election, to be a humble winner and to realize that everybody is, is so much needing the words of healing and that we can, we can be that, you know, we are, we, we don't have to be saying, Oh, I'm, I'm tired. So I give, or, you know, if, if we think of people of color, what they've experienced for 400 years, and yet they are continuing to participate and to, um, to, to stay in the, um, the fight for equality and justice, we can do that too. And so I, I think that um, the idea of how do we go from here, Patty, is such a, a really good one because I think it's not up to the government or the legislators, the Congress, the Senate, it's up to me and you, it's up to all of us, how we go on, how, how, we, how we show up, what's our narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking. So many beautiful sentiments so far. I couldn't agree more. And I think that these kinds of discussions are an example of, I think we, you know, each one of us has touched on something important that we're, that we're doing right now. And I think that it just, it comes from a place of curiosity and I've heard the word empathy used a lot and I and I think it's just truly understanding that people who you think are different from you are really not that different from you <laughs> and people are making decisions politically ultimately people have the same values you know they really they they want their their family to thrive and they they want to live in a country that they feel aligns with their values and i don't think that our values are all that different from one another but i think that we think that they are mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know if we really just took time to have conversations and and i've heard i am echoing a statement that was already said but i think so strongly that we need to be the kind of people we we are leaders but the fact that we're on this conversation right now means that we are leaders and people look to us to see how we put ourselves out there and having a conversation like this is really important and it's not emotion driven. Nobody is here to try to shove their point into the conversation and just, Hmm, I got one over on you. That's, that's, that's not helpful. And uh, I love, I love these kinds of conversations and I think curiosity and empathy are really what's going to move the needle in our country. That's a good point about having curiosity. Um, you know, that's part of having an open mind. Um, like Patty mentioned, half the country thinks a different way. Like you mentioned, you know, people are disappointed. Um, so we being open mind and what Jan, what you were saying about how your own children were wondering how you can have your profession. Meanwhile, that profession is how that you were able to raise them. So that kind of goes to the core of just who you're, who you are, your being. Um, but and having the communication like you had in, um, with you know, your friends and with your kids, um, having the communication is good and having an open mind about it. Um, but like you know, Marcy and Patty were saying, we are connected women of influence. Uh, we should be leaders in our community, in our workplace. Um, and then, you know, just think about what kind of impression do you want to be uh, have when you enter a room or a Zoom meeting or if you're posting something on social media, do you want to have a sort of presence or legacy where they're saying, oh no, what is she saying? Uh, what kind of negative energy is she going to bring? Or do you want to be the kind of person that says, I can't <laughs> wait to hear what project she's been working on. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's where we can try to take, move things forward is to be that catalyst to move forward. Yeah, you know, one of the really interesting things I learned about, um, I, mean, I, I I literally spent probably a hundred hours talking to the four of them, mostly individually, because I couldn't take them all in at once. But you know, it gave me a real opportunity to hear their perspective, which was good. Um, and I think they came to realize after many hours of conversations that they need to be a little um, more selective in what they hear and immediately assuming the truth of it. 
And it gave me an opportunity to really discuss within my life and what I've done in law enforcement and what the things I've done in my career that I feel have really helped. Um, I'm a big person for making sure that people's rights are not violated when you're when you're you know looking at their phones or looking at their DNA or you know that's really important to me. So we were able to have some of those conversations and I was able to impart on them, which I think was important, saying stuff, typing stuff, posting stuff isn't what changes the world mm. so and one of mm. my children in particular who's just you know not doing much of anything I'm like all right you you're so passionate about this you want to change the world let's finish your education you want to be a psychologist in the correctional facility I'm like oh my god that's going to change the world one person at a time mm -hmm. so I was really trying to focus these really strong passions into action that was meaningful and not action that was probably harmful. I mean, you can get yourself all wound up just doing all the typing and all the other stuff behind, you know, the social media barrier. But that was really interesting for me to be able to help move them from just anger with no outlet to, okay, I'm going to do this. And this is how I'm going to, my generation is now going to finally solve this problem. And I thought that was very rewarding. It was very painful and very exhausting, but it was really rewarding for me, I thought. I love that. I really do. I, I love what you said, Jen, because there is so much um, vitriol out there and, and people get caught up in it and and whatever they happen to be listening to or, or dialing in on just backs up what they, you know, what they already believe. And it's just more fuel for the fire type of thing. And then to say, okay, what are you going to do with that? You know, there, there isn't really a whole lot of value in just post, 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 you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and keeping right. this echo chamber of we all hate everything the same, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really help. So what are you going to get involved with? What are you going to, where are you going to lend your passion? Because you could change the world, you know, I mean, the, the world has been changed by people who got lit, you know, for, you know, for one reason or another. So I love that. And I wanted to add, your, uh, I wanted oh, to add, just go in there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love um, this. I love that everyone wants to talk. <laughs> who was I interrupting? Was that you, Marcy? Was I No, it was Gina. So she's up Gina. next. <laughs> Go ahead, Carolyn. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. It's a little bit, there's a little bit of a delay too. Um, in, in the concept of uh, being an elder or a mentor also, I think the younger generation is really key to move towards them, whether it's your own children or just in your sphere, your your network of younger people, because just like in the 60s, it was the younger people that really moved the needle in terms of um, social activism. And so now uh, here, I'm, I'm 67, so in my sphere, I really have this other role or, or position that I really enjoy, which is to be a, a person that is a listener and a, an encourager and an endorser of younger people. I think that's really an important point that you brought up, Jennifer. It's, it's immeasurable where that can lead. Yeah. They also have more energy than we do. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, I have, I, I'm doing distance learning with my five-year-old grandson. Oh. It is exhausting. <laughs> Woo -hoo. All right, Gina, you're on. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, Caroline kind of touched on that, you know, with being a mentor and Jen, you know, asking your, your, um, your child, what are you going to do? You know, directing them in the positive direction is what they're, what, you know, we're all needing, even, even someone, people our ages, having that frustration when it's like, okay, well, what do you want to do with that? What can you do about that? And I mean, if you can't do anything about it, then um, do things that you can control. I mean, you can control things in, at your workplace that, uh, you know, you don't want to start doing political stuff or, you know, at the workplace. Um, but so it's, it's, you know, just, you know, do something where you can, um, you know, help somebody like what you were doing, um, Carolyn, being a mentor, helping somebody in a positive way. I think that will also help people move forward. That they're, they're heard and you understand them you understand the frustrations and you want them to do something about it in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, this whole idea about social media 
has become so interesting because it's like all technology, how we say that technology uh, keeps growing quicker and quicker, you know, exponentially year over year, it's, it's bigger and faster and things become obsolete so much faster. And, and, and I was remembering back to like, I don't know, let's say uh, the 2000 election. I don't even remember there being, and maybe I'm totally wrong, um, a huge amount of information out there. Of course, social media was not as big of a deal, I guess, then, but you know, about, about the Bush Gore election, you know, you knew what was going on. You knew that, you know, the counts were going, you knew all of that stuff was going on, but it didn't seem like it was in your face 24 seven, you know, and then mm -hmm. even with 2008 and, and so forth, it wasn't, it just didn't seem like it was that in your face all the time. And starting with 2016 and then moving all the way through, you know, the last four years, it just seems like it's it's difficult to escape. And mm -hmm. um, Jen, I think you said things that people would never say to your face, they say behind a keyboard. And right. I know that that I've had my feelings hurt really bad by something that somebody would say to me that I would, and I started sort of challenging them, like, why would you say that to me? Why would you call me that name? Why would you? And then watch them just like fall all over themselves trying to, you know, <laughs> excuse it or whatever but there is there is this anonymity that is there that invites um disrespect and invites uh pushing the boundaries i do you guys agree is that what you've seen or oh 100 percent. and then i think also and somebody else touched on this but what happens is it's very easy to argue your point when you have time to research or go to an influencer that you're following, take some of their sound bites and regurgitate it. You can do that when you have the, uh, the platform of social media because you have time. You don't have, it's not, it's not like this conversation where it's back and forth and it's real time and you're looking at someone in the eyes or even if you're on the phone, it's, it's different because you have time to formulate your argument and really stick it to them and let them know that you know what's going on and say it perfectly or get that insult just right it's different when you're when you're in that format and I think a lot of people's manners and just their just their decorum shifts because they are emboldened and I do think they're you're right with the last um, two major elections um, the 2000 and 2008 prior prior to social media, it's true. We only had a few news outlets uh, and it, there wasn't social media in 2008. There really wasn't. There was my state space and, and <laughs> Facebook was in its infancy. So yeah. I, yeah, I think social media can, can be, um, it's a beautiful tool for a lot of reasons, but it's also, we all have experienced how exhausting and negative it can be. So I don't want to be, oh, it's social media, but I think we need to learn. It's a skill set, how to have a conversation and how to really receive information. And that's a muscle that needs to be practiced. And I think it's probably atrophied since we've had social media in our lives. I agree. Yeah. You know, an interesting thing about it too, since I have these four kids and we're a blended family. So they are 20, what are they now? 20, 21, 22, and 23. So, you know, bless your heart. Oh, God bless America. It's they have just with four teenagers in the house. I mean, <laughs> I oh, yeah. they've been together since they were one, two, three, and four. So, oh yeah. my God. Anyway, um, what, what it's so I, they're all very different and two are mine and, you know, are built, you know, are mentally wired like me and two are not. And so it's been really interesting for me. But the social media thing that I find to be distressing is that it's it's all it's all it's almost like all a farce like we only post we've always only posted the best looking pictures of ourselves exactly. and we only you know want the best uh, the best um, outpouring of what we are for other people to see but the fact that they spend so much time especially the younger ones really trying to create an image that they think other people will like and then they wait to see what kind of response they're going to get from that and so that's kind of to me what all of this is about too and i heard so much of this with the four of them in these conversations it's like 
one of my kids, one of my stepdaughters got into this big fight with a friend because her friend hadn't posted enough stuff about the whole racial discord. So, so there was this whole falling out because I posted this many things, but you didn't. I mean, what is that? And so yeah. thankfully she came back to reality and they and apologized and went on, but that happened. And, and one of and my child, my youngest had someone else call her out for what that person thought that she was on social media in front of everyone. And it kind of gave them both perspective about how dangerous that is also. And I mm-hmm. saw a lot of calming down after that because it, they kind of got a taste of what it's like to just be assaulted by stuff that whoever's doing it doesn't even necessarily really believe. They're just trying to create an impression. Yes. Yes, Jennifer, I'm so glad you brought that up because there is this there is this culture in social media where if you are a business owner, you have to post so many times a week in order to be relevant, which I completely disagree with. And when we see these social causes coming out, um, especially this was magnified with the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement this summer, it, it was, it, there was a lot of shaming. And even I questioned, I, I even went to a mastermind group that I'm a part of. And I said, what, how am I supposed to show up in this environment by not saying something? Am I contributing to the problem? If I'm saying something, is it just to look like I'm present and I'm woke? And it really bothered me that I was having this internal argument, but I'm, you know, of, of an age and have enough self-awareness to know that I, I found my lane, but I, I, I can imagine someone who's younger and doesn't have the self-awareness or even know where they stand feels this shaming to contribute in such a way. And it's, and I, and I see that very, very much Jennifer. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think a lot of people are posting things because they feel like they have to have a standard and they need to be seen as an influencer and all of this really veneer and facade and it's not real. <laughs> Cause then you wonder well, a lot of these, a lot of these problems we're having are based on false advertising, you know? The people who are actually <laughs> doing and saying whatever whatever it is don't actually really feel or think that. And so then we right. have all of these battles that are escalating about nothing, you know? Yep. And that's, that's yep. really, that is to me kind of shocking and very tragic. I agree. It's like we have so much, um, we have so many platforms for content. We need to generate content to fill up these platforms. <laughs> right. You know, what you said, Marcy, about shaming, I think there is just, there's, man, there's just something there. There has been a huge amount of shaming, you know, it, whether it's social media or, or uh, out in your communities or, or what have you, you know, that, that is, and, you know, Carolyn, I'm going to, I'm tossing this to you right now because this is kind of your lane as far as um, how, where, what do we do with some of those feelings, you know, um, around Black Lives Matter, around um, social injustice of, of any kind. I mean, there's it, possibly for some of us, there's been, there's been things that have happened that hurt more than others, you know, but but what do you do with some of that? You know, where do you, what do we do with that? Well, um, I'll, I'll take a, a, a run at this and I'm sure it's a, a conversation that we all have some, some input. Mine is that when I made the discovery at 62 years of age that I didn't know anything about the murder of Emmett Till, mm-hmm. I realized how I, I, that I had a lot to learn. And I realized that I had consumed a a portion of American history that left out a lot of trauma for other people other than myself. So what that did for me is it launched an inquiry into um, my own experience and a challenging of my own mindset. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a good place to start. And I think repair has to start with truth telling. So to really get the truth, like let's just say about American history, it's uh, we could say that I wasn't there, I wasn't a slave owner or I wasn't involved. But then as I was looking through the decades of my life, I realized that I really did have a, a high degree of implicit bias. 
So just to start to look at myself. So yes, that does produce guilt. And that, that can't be that that's the end of the story. Right. And so we just have to, in fact, there's a thing called white tears where when there's a group and there's a discussion about some of the racial trauma, it, the white women will cry. And then all of the focus is over on the white woman and how she's feeling guilty as opposed to, okay, let's, let's look at what has happened and what can happen today. And to, to start with that reckoning, I think that was for me, it was a reckoning of just how I had um, unintentionally been consuming things that just were part of the culture, just because of, I grew up in, um, you know, an all white church all white neighborhood, all white Girl Scout troop, all white high school, you know, that was my, that's my culture. So the, uh, how do we go, for, how do we go forward? I think the, um, the ability to be a learner and to make mistakes is really key and to not be afraid to make mistakes. And I, I think also that to realize that there are still vestiges of things that still need to be worked on. You know, when even like when we look at the Electoral College, there's a lot of discussion about the Electoral College, but it was its basis was in the three fifths rule. I mean, it's it's a history that I wasn't even aware of. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's an, that, that's a good example for all of us that have just sort of been um, moving through being the dominant culture that uh, back in the days when the Electoral College was started, it was so that the South could have their slaves count, they couldn't vote, but they could count in their population for elect to help with who was elected president. There and is a, an amazing podcast. Sorry to break in, Carolyn, but sure. uh, it's called Through Line uh, by NPR. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and they will take some of these, they take what's happening now and then they, they, they present, how did that happen? You know, like, like Jen, in your case, like with policing, how, what's the history of policing? When did that even begin? But the whole story about the Electoral College was like, whoa, I was, I was literally listening to this podcast and going, oh, 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 oh no, <laughs> oh, wow, didn't think of that, uh-oh, you know, it was, it was really, um, I mean, it was just a fabulous education around, mm -hmm. um, you know, the issues of, of the three fifths of a person and, okay, that sounds great. Oh, but wait a minute. We just freed them. Uh Oh, now they're a whole person. What do we do with that now? And then the very first time that the electoral college and the popular vote didn't match. Oh no. What do we do about that? It, it was, it's a really, I mean, I totally recommend this podcast. It's hugely awesome. So, Yeah. Uh, I, I heard it too, Patty. I was just, I was knocked out because I, I had not known that. And there are so many things that are like that. For example, um, my father was career Navy and we got a, a GI loan to buy a little house in 1953, you know, in um, an all white suburb. And those same loans were not available to uh, veterans of color. So there's just things about history that just there, that reckoning and from there to really be an, uh, an ally for our, uh, for our sisters, you know, those that haven't had it as easy. And um, then I think the, the idea of um, reparations, you know, there's lots of ways to look at reparations that in the Christian tradition, there's confession and repentance. And these are all sort of concepts that are based on, this is what happens when there's been a disservice or a trauma, there's a, there's a healing that has actions to it. So to be open to looking at what those might be, because we've all been hurt by this, you know, all, all of us, because it's, it's not in our moral, it's not in alignment with who we are. It's not, it's, it's, we, we know we want to create a world that's really beautiful for everyone. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of ways to um, move beyond the guilt and to take action and be an ally. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm also seeing a lot of shaming and just like a lot of everyday things, you know, about whether or not you have certain signs in your house you know, even if you're wearing a mask or if you're choosing to go somewhere uh, where people are just so quick to bring out their phones and record it and post it on social media to shame you amongst neighbors. And, and this is not even race, racial related. 
Um, do you think that, you know, shaming is kind of a, a form of bullying? Hmm. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> oh, I yeah. do. Yeah. Hmm. And yeah, I mean, one of my, one of my favorite women that, that has a platform right now is Brene Brown. And she talks mm -hmm. a lot about shaming mm -hmm. and yes, I definitely think it's bullying and it, and it comes from a place I think where maybe, yeah, maybe you think that you're doing the right thing, but um, yeah, sh shaming is very powerful and it's sneaky. I think it comes in, in a lot of forms that you wouldn't label it shaming, but it, yeah it's definitely a form of, of bullying. Well, yeah, and also it shuts down conversations. Yes. It shuts down conversations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I struggle with this in particular. Um, I, I, since being in law enforcement and seeing, I mean, I, I work in both in San Diego and particularly in Chula Vista, it's a very multicultural police force. And in Chula Vista, we're very lucky to have a great relationship with the community. But when I talk to my officers about the fact that they're out there on the street, putting their lives on the line, you know, in the middle of the night and they can't be with their family and they got a person who's, you know, you know, on drugs or mentally having some sort of breakdown and it's dangerous and it's loud and you have people standing around you with their cell phones in your face. Like I'm watching you, I'm watching you, I'm watching you, I'm watching you. And they're trying to, you know, take care of, you know, what needs to be taken care of and the, and the best way they can. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine what that's like every day on the street when you're trying to keep people safe and everyone is trying to show that they're gonna catch you if you don't do everything perfectly. I mean, the fact that we even have police officers anymore, I gotta tell you, it means that they're just these amazing people who wanna help more than they wanna, you know, have a job that's safer and, you know, not as traumatizing. So mm. I have no, no, no um, tolerance for shaming. It's it's wrong. I think if you shame someone, then you don't have an articulate argument. If you're shaming someone, you don't want to hear something other than what you feel, and you don't have the words to express how you feel. And I, I think it's absolutely bullying. It's it's absolutely bullying. And, and it's I love this. I, I love what yeah. you guys are saying. Literally, I mean, just the. Um, you know, we started out with how do we bring things together? How do we ever heal? And the idea of shaming and bullying being such a, it shuts all the communication down. It's like, it's a constant reminder of, oh, I need to be over on this side or, oh, I need to be on that side. And the, uh, you know, the pandemic has brought in such, such a, a huge amount of shaming. And if you don't believe this, or if you don't believe that, or, you know, whatever, um, th the fact that something like a, a public health pandemic would become a political and, uh, and divisive issue is just, I think, so indicative of where we have ended up, you know, so Marcy, I'm sorry, I stepped on you. <laughs> no, you I would, I think, um, and I, I learned this from uh, Brene Brown too. She she puts it like this. She says, um, when you call someone a name or you shame them, if you say um, that Donald Trump is a clown or Hillary Clinton is a bitch, when you use names and you use words that are um, not their not their name or not their title, what that does is that. In a, in a small little way, it dehumanizes them. And then when that person is dehumanized, the human um, rationale is that you can treat them less than human. Mm -hmm. And you, you and she, she made an analogy, which is a pretty big leap, but you know, think about how the Nazis were able to dehumanize Jews and what that led to. So we all need to remember that we are humans. We have the same blood coursing through our veins. We breathe the same air. We are all made of the same flesh and blood. And if you can remember that, then I think that you take responsibility for remembering that because I don't want to preach. I want to, I want to be the example. And, you know, it's, and sometimes I just do a little exercise. I'll just drive in my car and I'll just look at every person that drives by in their car or I'll walk down the street and look at every person and just be like, yeah, they're, they've got the same problems I have, <laughs> you know? So it's, I think it's just remember, remembering that we're, we're all humans. 
Yeah, we all need connection too. I like that you do that. I think that's awesome. I try to do that when I'm out and about. I try to connect visually with everyone I walk by. With a hello, good morning, how are you, whatever. Just because, I mean, I've read some studies that talk about how isolating it is if no one even looks at you, if you, no one mm -hmm. makes that little connection. And so, especially people that are marginalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People people that maybe are in live on the streets or people that are already down. Already down. <laughs> you know, we don't want to look at them yeah. because oh, I don't want I don't want to create a conversation. What it's also hard as a woman walking around the world, I don't always I don't always love initiating. Yeah. Uh, my husband's super chummy with everybody, and I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna be like chummy because as a woman, I also am defensive, but. <laughs> But it's the same. It's the same thing. You can look at someone and smile at them and say good morning, and that um, you know that's the human. That's a human connection. What would happen if we just stopped for a minute before you know, like um, not everything that comes into our head needs to come out of our mouth. You know, like what if you just stopped once in a while and before you said something, you know, you just paused for a minute. And, um, you know, the other day, somebody that's in my Facebook group, it, this is a very well-meaning, very wonderful person. And they posted something about um, buying, you know, supporting small business, you know, right now we should, we should be not buying from the big box stores, we should be buying and supporting small business. I'm a huge advocate for small business. I've been a small business owner. I'm a huge advocate for that. But as I read this post, I thought right now there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of money and the decision to go to a small business versus Walmart is an economic decision. It's not, it's not a community support or where do I stand on a, on a, a particular platform. It's, it's truly a life and death how much money do I have in my bank account? And, and as I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, the person that posted that didn't even think what that meant. But if we just ever stopped and thought, how, how is this going to be received by, you know, by maybe a marginalized person or somebody who's just lost a family member or someone who just lost their job or, or what have you, you know, um, I don't know what, what could, how far could that go towards trying to heal some of these rifts. You know, it's interesting that it's, it's whatever reality you live in. And this is another conversation I've had with my kids over and over again. You know, the reality they live in is we are doing well. We have our jobs. We have our house. We have no one sick. They have, are, they're all in college. They're getting paid for. They have transportation. Everything is good. So we had the, at the dinner table last night, one of my, one of my stepdaughters said to me, you know, I think they should just close down the country for another six weeks, just close it all down. And that is what we should do. And basically anyone who doesn't think we should do that doesn't really care about people. And I'm like, you know, you need to, you have to look at all sides here. You close down for six more weeks, whether or not that's a good idea. I'm not arguing that, but you have to recognize the fact that 80,000 more businesses might go out. I mean, people, so many more people might lose all of the rest of their money or any hope they had of keeping their businesses alive or any hope they had of making another rent. I mean, and so to me, part of the problem is the people come from a, 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 their own world, their own bubble, which we also see with, with this whole discussion about systemic racism. You come from your own bubble and you just don't understand why everyone doesn't see things the way you do. Right. And that, so you feel like you're a friend. You feel like, well, that's a really great thing to say. That's her bubble. She probably can afford to go to small businesses and, and not go to Walmart, but that, that is a problem. And I preach this to my, my, my students. I preach this to my people I work with and my kids. You have to look at all angles of every, every situation. There's rarely a one side or the other. It's almost always somewhere in the middle. If you don't take the time to look at what other people are thinking, before you interject, mm -hmm. then you're going to look stupid mm -hmm. or you'll be hurtful. Mm -hmm. and I think it's also giving people the benefit of the doubt, um, you know, just giving people grace, like, you know, what you're saying, maybe she knows the small business owner and is wanting to like help them out, you That's know, and, 
And so not to like you know, tear her down because she's not, you know, you maybe you personally or you're someone in your family or close network um, is struggling and they can't afford to go there. So it's like give the people a benefit of the doubt and, and um, you know, they could maybe she, she just had good intentions. Um, also, I mean, with, with and that can be applied to anything, just um, so people are so quick to um, be judgmental and think people have bad intentions. Like I think if we realize like we said earlier, that we all have the good intentions. We all want the same thing, and we all want to be positive. Like let's let's try to think it. Well, maybe that, whatever it is um, that someone's posting or sharing or talking in a room, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what? They obviously maybe don't know my personal circumstances. I'm sure she's trying to be positive. Um, to Carolyn, to your point, maybe someone hasn't done a lot of background and research, uh, and, you know, read up on. Um, you know, different, um, you know, from the black community. And so you know, to make them feel like they're ignorant, um, you know, they're just not educated or just wasn't aware of it because of the bubble that they're in. So it's that they're an evil person or a bad person. You know, we just, if we all just looked at everybody with grace and just think that, you know, they have, for the most part, everybody has good intentions. Oh, that's so well said. <laughs> Yeah, when everything's just good or bad, it's so you can't see those things. When it's just binary and there's two choices, it's just not that easy. There's just a lot of things in between that. <laughs> but you know what, Megan, yeah. that's absolutely right. It, we have become a binary uh, civilization. It seems like, you know, you're either this or you're that. And where's the and? because there, there's got to be an and in there. I am this and I am that, you know? Well, and, is, that, is that true or is that what we perceive to be true? Because I don't know, I have a huge swath of friends that are not like me in a lot of different ways. And you know, we're not that different. Mm -hmm. Somehow I think we're being told that we're black and white, we're red, we're blue, we're this, we're that. And I don't- I don't think we are. Really. I don't think that we really are. It just mm -hmm. is what we're being told. That's the narrative right. that we are so divided. Are we that divided? I, I think that's know. a really good question and a good point that what is the narrative and to yeah. be in our own life, just really um, taking the responsibility to sweep my own front porch mm -hmm. and watch my own narrative and watch what I speak and with my family too, I, I think anyone who is in a position to be a, an example, as we all are all the time, but that that narrative, um, we have a part in the narrative. You know, we we have we speak, and so I think we have a lot of power to to make an impact. And it's uh, it's it isn't really like the government's job; it's our job. Wow. Yeah, that's that is a good point. I never thought of that perspective because I would have said before now that yes, we do feel very uh, binary as a as a country. Although in my own head, I can hold multiple thoughts at the same time, and I'm not conflicted. I don't feel binary. But you're right. I think the media and the dialogue and the story that is popular right now is that we are very binary. And that's based on election results. You know, it, that's based on a very narrow set of data points. So if we're looking at our country through the lens of this election, we are going to look like a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> but I think that if we look at it through a different lens, that might be more helpful. We, we could look at it, you know, any number of different perspectives, and we might not see ourselves as so binary. Well, an election is very black or white. You had two choices, right? Right. Yeah. And I mean, I know, I know. Well, technically you had three, but you know. <laughs> in general, you know, it's there's, so you you automatically get categorized in one way or the other, but if right. you really talk to people who voted this way or that way, what they want and what they're, why they are, I mean, there's not a lot of people who, I mean, there's not a lot of people who don't have a pretty good idea of what they want to see their government do. And every conversation I've ever had with anyone, we, we always end the same way. Gosh, we wish... Gosh, we wish we had a third part, a third choice, right? A third party. I mean, my entire life, I've heard that if we had a third party, we didn't have to do this or this, 
we could do this where almost everyone probably is mm -hmm. that would be really awesome i don't know why we can't pull that off but and why do we have parties is that a naive question to ask i am certainly no election or you know political science scholar but why do we have parties so, so i think personally i think this is a human nature kind of thing and this kind of goes back to the ones and zeros a binary decision um, somehow we have to have a, this is me and that is you, or this is my guy and that is your guy. I don't know why, but I think it's just deeply entrenched in human nature. And I, I had this conversation with somebody recently. I said, remember when we were back in, in elementary school and junior high, and you decided you were going to run for class president or whatever. And there was no parties. You're just, I'm running and, and you have no power. You have nothing you can promise. All you're doing is just, you know, trying to make your case one way or another and then somebody would win and then that was that was that and in height when i was in high school i had a very progressive high school it was in northern california bay area and and we actually had political conventions and we created political parties and wow surprise there were three of them there were two big ones and there was one little one and we had all day conventions and people stood up and they made their platform and other people stood up and yelled at them and, and all of this stuff. And, and I remember thinking, and so I was a kid, 15 years old. So of course I was brilliant, but I was remember thinking, this isn't like, right. You know, it seems like we should just be trying to figure out what Terry wants and what Susan wants and what, you know, like it, it just seemed so, weird so you know when we we started out talking about how do we bring things together how do you bring things together when it's all a this or that it, mm -hmm. you know yes and i i was for me this election i i know there was a lot of talk around oh um i wish there was a third option but for me what i really was craving was a candidate that i could vote for yeah. as opposed to um, the way I voted personally was I voted against someone. And yes, I liked the candidate that I voted for, um, but I just really was longing for um, an, someone or a candidate and or a team of candidates that really inspired me that I could vote for. And, you know, it's just, that that was really missing for me in this in this dialogue this this time. Well, you know, I mean, my first time I ever paid attention to a, an election was when Reagan ran for the first time. So you know, all of that um, patriotism and that excitement, and you know, all, all the stuff around him, whether you liked him or not, he was very exciting. And there was a lot of um, I was excited. But I mean, I, if you look at what happens to people who run for office. I mean, at any level, I, I had thought for a long time that I would love to get into politics. But I think, honestly, by the time you get past something that's pretty, pretty, I mean, and, and I went through this in my own career where I was absolutely literally doing the thing that is the right thing to do. And I just got my ass kicked at a political level because it wasn't the political thing to do. And so I would worry that pretty soon in order to keep your job, and continue to do what you thought was right, you have to start sacrificing things yeah. about yourself and just do a little bit here and a little bit there and pretty soon. Right, you're, like you're the back end deals and promising right. this to get this and then it just gets watered down. Yes, I agree, that's so exhausting. It's exhausting and I think when you look at what happened to either of these candidates, I mean, whether you like Trump or not, I mean, literally what he went through over the last four years on a daily basis and what Biden will likely go through over the next four years if you do you want to be put through that and so it's almost like our best that. people are like way too smart way too smart to go and put themselves and their families and their whole lives through the terrible treatment that you get as soon as you get certain height in politics you know it is just terrible it's terrible what happens to you it's, it, it's our city level so <laughs> Huh? It's brutal at our city level. It can get pretty heated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah, it's, it is. And you wonder why anybody would choose to do it. I mean, it would eat me alive. I mean, I don't think you know. It would be hard. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, what you said, Marcy, about wanting to be inspired. Um, 
I have never voted for a candidate. And okay. that's a sad thing to say. I've never voted for a candidate. I have always voted against. And and so that tells you what side I'm, I mean, I'm on all, I've been on all the sides before. Um, and there was, it, it, there's only been certain points in my life where there's been a candidate that got me like really jazzed. And so I went out and walked for them or, or I, you know, this time text banked or phone banked or what have you for them, you know, and they, they ended up not being the ultimate candidate. But when it came down to the two, you know, you've got two, maybe you got a third, but I, I have not voted for a candidate ever. And that, that is very sad. And I think, I mean, for me, it's very sad. I can see Jen, you're not in your head. It's like, I think that I is that. indicative of, of the division and, and why um, I kind of go back to, to what Carolyn said earlier tonight is it's up to us to be that light in the world, you know, to be that, um, standard bearer to say there's got to be a better way there's got to we have to represent something different we have to be willing to step up and and do what we can where we can you know whatever that might look like um because because there is a whole lot of that it's this or that it's mm -hmm. us or them mm -hmm. yes and feeling like the power it doesn't exist in you because okay well i made my vote i'm just gonna turn it over to the government now that's not how it works yeah. and i i think um that's for me personally that's a great takeaway from this conversation is uh to continue knowing what where my integrity integrity lies and know what uh values and issues that are important to me and continue to do what I consider the good work. And I mean, I'm a huge environmentalist. So for me, I do a lot of work all year round uh, for the issues that I care about. And it has nothing to do with an election year. So in a way, maybe we're putting too much emotion into uh, these elections and these candidates when there really should be more this feeling that there's a grassroots effort. And we definitely saw that uh, this summer with um, with the racial injustice issues that got bubbled right up to the top of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we had a lot of incredibly effective and powerful conversations in our own communities because of that. And that had nothing to do with an election. It had nothing to do with our pandemic, <laughs> but it poked its head through the surface in a big way. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to remember that, that we're not, we, we're not defined by who's president. I love that. Yeah, Thank that's you. really a good point, what you said about how on your own, um, you do a lot of things that you care about. Um, and I think that's indicative of the American spirit that we don't need to have government, a platform, tell us what to do. Um, even mm -hmm. companies on their own um, are doing innovation um, because they have their own vision for 10 years, 15 years, you know, even a five-year goal. Um, and so we don't need to have, um, you know, depend on government to do something for us. So I think that is really the American spirit. And also when you are, um, you know, whether you're voting for someone or voting against someone, I think it's really important um, you know, that we, and the personalities are, and character, I mean, you can put anybody side by side, and you can go tit for tat on their background, their education, their family, and even from, you know, I was reading, a, I'm reading currently the biography of Alexander Hamilton, and even back then, there was, you know, his, with his family, his indiscretions with women, um, you know, same with Thomas Jefferson, his indiscretions. Um, and so you, but anybody can go tip for tat on their character. So it's really, right. you know, for a lot of people, it was like, okay, so what have they done while serving the American people? Uh, and so I think that's, you know, another way of looking at the voting and uh, who to vote for. But like you said, it's already, we've passed our vote. I mean, we've done everything we can do. We've voted. Um, and now the people that are whose full time job to, um, you know, to certify the election. I mean, it's out of our hands. It's up to those organizers and officiants to do what they need to do. And as far as moving forward, because like at the beginning, and this, we said it hasn't done yet, <laughs> it hasn't been certified yet. We don't have the, the elect officially. Um, and so 
once we have that, I mean, we're trying to move forward now, um, but once we have that, we can, you know, officially move forward. And I mean, we can just hope that we can just continue to be a light within our circle and continue to be positive. And, you know, I think we need to go back to the old adage of in polite circles, you never talk about religion or politics. <laughs> I mean, it might be like we just go back to that old, um, you know, way of, um, you know, how you behave in, in, in public. Very well said. Plus, you know what? There's something to be said for good manners. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, we all have to work hard on that in my family. It's like, you know what? We don't need to, if you, if you can only come up with a string of cuss words, then you haven't reflected enough on whatever your topic is. So let's, let's be polite. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt. Let's not be judgmental. And everyone's lives are going to be a lot better. Mm hmm Jen, I think you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least a blog about what it's like to. Oh, God, you have no yeah, idea. I'm interested in your family dynamic. I think, I, yeah, I agree. I agree with Patty. It's well, great. I, my family has often told me, I have told them that I could be a best-selling author if I wrote about the exploits of my family. <laughs> they have told me that they would disown me as their mom. So. <laughs> I have had some crazy experiences with those four. Oh, yes, I have. Promise them some royalties and maybe they'll change their mind. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. So, I, had to, I had to develop a very excellent sense of humor to survive it all. Mm -hmm. Wow. But I, I think in a way, your fam, the way you described it, Jen, you know, that you're on this side, you know, your husband's on this side, and then here's these four um, mouthpieces in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> who have not learned how to filter what they say or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, I'd, I'd be an excellent. I'd subscribe to that podcast. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give it some thought. I'll give it some thought. But, yeah, they're 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 uh, their time, right? You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, I am I am so thrilled that you joined me here in the ladies' room tonight, and and I uh, this conversation was everything I had hoped that it would be, uh, as far as just illuminating some of the challenges that we have, some of the things that we have to consider moving forward. And I think some of the, uh, the things coming out of this is like, my God, you know, just learn some humility and, and learn how to take a pause and learn how to give people the benefit of the doubt and learn how to consider every once in a while, you just might not be right. And, and at the end of the day, did you win this fight or did you, lose this fight, you know, regardless of where it, it ultimately ends up. So I, I am so grateful to all of you for having been here and what you've contributed. You were, you're all fabulous. And anyone who listens to this after the fact, which, which they will, they will listen to this after the fact. Um, I encourage you to take these things to heart, do something with this thought process and, and move forward to make this world just a, a better place you know we all have that opportunity to make a difference where we are and and whatever that looks like for you that's what you need to do you need to be true to yourself you need to stand in your in your power in the power of your convictions and you just need to move forward and make a difference in this world so thanks to all of you for joining me thanks to all of you that have participated and that will listen to this afterwards and go forth and make it a freaking better world, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, thank, thank, you. thank you, Patty. 2021 Very comes fun. soon, please. <laughs> I know. It was an honor to be a part of this discussion with all of you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you, too. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so Had much. Have a great time. Take thank care, you, everybody. You are awesome. <laughs> Bye.